Hello and welcome to The Dinosaur for week 18, another seven curious, interesting things I saw last week. So let's crack on. Uh, the first one is probably something you didn't think you needed to know about, but you probably do, which are spherical flexor joints. Uh, so this one actually is a, a scientific paper I noticed that was uh, had two new versions of this joint in it. It basically is a joint with lots of hinges that actually uses pretty much no moving parts, or you know, one moving part, because it, it is a moving part. Um, but there are no hinges, there are no nothings, but it actually, in this example, can keep the point uh, of this needle um, at the same relative point in space, just because of the very complicated design of the actual shape itself, and it's the way it flexes, hence flexure joints. So, um, yeah, this is incredible. So that point, as you can see, is, is flexing, is basically staying in midair with an accuracy of 1.9%. So that's the deviation of that point. So um, kind of neat. Uh, yes, uh, they do actually supply the 3D print file if you want to print this out and, and do it yourself, which I think is also kind of neat. Um, so why is this interesting? Well, uh, you know, you've got uh, robotics. Uh, you've got also things like, uh, you know, steady cam mounts could be quite interesting, although that's probably done more in software these days. Um, but also you've got the reduction of complicated joints that could fail. So what we're seeing these days is on aeroplanes, for instance, you've got uh, air intakes that close or open because of the ambient temperature around them because they actually deform because of the temperature. There are no flaps, there are no hinges, there are no actuators. So the, the, the removal of moving parts that could fail is, is kind of where the industry is going uh, and that's where a lot of engineering is going these days. So uh, this is a pretty neat experiment. So there you go, uh, interesting. Mighty, this is a little bit tricky to explain, but this is a cloud-based, cloud-based thing. Um, so this is a browser in the cloud that you get to through a browser. So uh, that's why it's a bit confusing. So I'll explain that. So what this is, is when you're searching for things on the internet or you're doing some things in a web app, for instance, um, then there can be quite a big uh, processor overhead. It can even crash your browser sometimes. If you're doing something that takes a lot of searching and you've got a slow internet search uh, or connection, then um, wouldn't it be amazing if you had a one gigabit connection? So what this does is if, it, if you want to search for something, you search for something through Mighty. Uh, and what it will then do is go, oh, I see what you're searching for. I'll search for it on my one gigabit connection in the cloud and I'll return you the results. Likewise, if you're trying to do some computation in the cloud, it will do that for you as well on a super fast processor. So uh, it does everything a lot faster. Obviously, it saves lots of people crunching their processors and all that sort of stuff. So it's more power uh, efficient. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of interesting. And it's got lots of kind of neat built-in features as well. It's got a, a like a shortcut to join a Zoom meeting um, and those sorts of things. It removes ads for you. And also because it's cloud-based, you can log into it from any browser, or any device and still get the, the previous session you were on. So any document you had open, anything you were processing uh, can still be got uh, from any device. So uh, yeah, that's kind of curious. It also costs $30 a month for this privilege. So um, if you are a big web app uh, user, uh, or need to do quite a lot of number crunching, this may be worth it, who knows. Um, Google have, uh, a, or a, actually it was a, I think it was in the New York Times, um, a really interesting article uh, about Google's return to office plans and how they're planning to do that using technology innovation. Um, so they have three philosophies here. Um, so work happens anywhere, not just in the office is one of them. Um, what employees need from workplace uh, is changing constantly. So don't come up with one thing and, and sort of basically nail it to the floor. Um, and workplaces need to be more than just desks, meeting rooms and amenities is the third one. So as you can see here, uh, this is a robotic uh, wall uh, that if you would like to have a private meeting uh, or a semi-private meeting, uh, it can extend and inflate, which is kind of neat as well. Uh, there's lots of other things they've got as well. So they have these kind of spherical um, uh, meeting areas with video walls in there for, for colleagues to appear on, for instance, outdoor spaces with lots of Wi-Fi. Um, and even they go as far as, well, how will restaurants work on campus now? So instead of having a restaurant where you can essentially you, you know go and grab things and whatever then everything is now boxed um, and those sorts of things so really interesting article um, I think it might need a uh, subscription but um, I think you can get the gist of it from uh, the video as well um, so really really interesting uh, what they're doing uh, and how they're sort of already innovating uh, and this will be the industry standard that everybody will then start to lean into and go ah we need to be doing this as well 
Um, restaurants, so ghost restaurants, this is a weird one. So this uh, I saw on uh, Twitter, um, and then there was an article about it as well that sort of followed up, hence why it's caught my eye twice this week. Uh, so these are ghost kitchens. So this is the um, sort of, you know, uh, delivery, Deliveroo, Uber Eats, uh, you know, all of those sorts of people have created an industry. So um, it, whereas before you used to have a restaurant that could actually give you Chinese food and it would be the Chinese food restaurant, now actually you don't really know where your food is coming from. So um, there are companies out there like the Flavor Factory who can actually come up with ghost brands so they will come up with not only the the logo the name um, they will look at the local area and what it can sustain and therefore you can just have a virtual kitchen uh, that makes the food receives the order somebody comes around picks it up and the person who's ordering it is none the wiser so i thought it was really interesting where you've got these sort of disrupted distribution chains all of a sudden that you can't quite see the end-to-end -end version of uh, even food these days and food delivery um, and one industry has now created a, a second industry or a third industry in this case so food food delivery now you've got sort of people coming up with virtual kitchens for food delivery so um yeah i just thought that was really quite interesting how uh, restaurants don't really need to exist anymore as long as you think they exist that's good enough for you um in, in night vision goggle news uh, the u.s army now has uh, some new uh, night vision goggles the envg bs I don't know really how you would pronounce that, but uh, there you go. Um, so uh, what you used to get is the, the green phosphorus, slightly fuzzy version of this, um, and it would amplify uh, light signals. So you'd at least need some light on the target to be able to amplify it with that green phosphorus thing. They've now moved to a white phosphorus display, and also they've thrown some augmented reality at it as well, so they can now outline shapes. Um, well, this is also using post-processing uh, within the, the headset itself. Um, so you can identify objects, you can also identify um, people a lot more easily, etc, etc. So um, one also the thing you can do with it as well is you can connect your night vision goggles to a third party weapon as well. So for instance, if you do have a gun with a uh, remote wireless sight on it, you can point the gun around the corner, you can still see where the gun is pointing without your face having to be at the end of it. So um, yeah, <laughs> it's, um, obviously this is where this starts with military use, but there was some really interesting. Uh, this is this is basically the the ultimate in sort of low light at the moment. So um, if you work in this sort of space, then that's pr probably quite interesting to you. Um, but yeah, so now if you're doing any visualization of green phosphorus screens, you should probably upgrade it to this. Um, Chugi is a is a word you should probably know about at the moment. It's uh, whizzing around TikTok right now. Chugi is kind of you know when people are trying a little bit too hard. Um, they're trying to be a little bit on trend. Um, all that sort of stuff. So, you know, this, as in this example here, they're still using Pinterest, for instance. Um, so, yeah, the, the reason I saw this is uh, last year there was a really interesting uh, article about made up emotion words. So, that if uh, the, the language, for instance, uh, that we have, especially in English, only has a certain amount of emotional range. Uh, there are many more emotions than we actually feel, but we can't actually label them, so therefore we don't tend to talk about them. And if you could only come up with a new word for an emotion, you can then start talking about it. So I thought this was really interesting that, um, you know, obviously <laughs> boomers have had it sort of tough because of millennials, and now the Zoomers are now uh, basically telling the millennials that, like, stop trying so hard. Um, you don't need to try that hard. So, um I just thought it was really interesting about how new words come into uh, use. This was actually coined, I think, probably about 10 years ago, something like that, um, by a school student, um, Gabby Razon. Um, and it's only really um, started to become useful. Um, but yeah, so it's basically, you don't need to try that hard. Uh, if you uh, still are wearing Ugg boots, for instance, you might be called Chugi at some point uh, as a sort of a well-meaning rib. Um, so interesting only as a point as like should where do these words come from and should your brand start owning them if you're really into tiktok for instance there you go um we made some oxygen on mars which i think is really really interesting so this is the last one by the way uh so um the the perseverance rover had this little module inside it that can take in um co2 
um, so carbon dioxide, and 96% of the Martian atmosphere is carbon dioxide, so there's a lot of it. Um, basically what it does is it uses energy, uh, i.e. solar energy, to split it into carbon monoxide and O2, oxygen. Um, so the carbon monoxide can actually be used as fuel, which is good, uh, and the O2 can be used to breathe. So um, obviously the Perseverance rover doesn't have a huge amount of energy, it has to run all of the different things on its, its solar cells basically, so it can't really just say, let's just make loads and loads of oxygen. Um, so it has been working for a, a fair few uh, fair few months trying to get this work sorted out. Um, apparently they can make five grams a day of oxygen, so that'll keep um, a person working as long as they don't expend too much energy for about 10 minutes. So at the moment they can only give somebody 10 minutes per day, which is not really going to work. But the point is, if you expand this out, um, then all of a sudden you can start supplying um, a, a decent amount of oxygen for a human habitation of Mars. Um, and they've worked out that it'll actually take a metric tonne of oxygen to uh, sustain four astronauts for a year. Um, and the more interesting thing is, is if you can create oxygen, then you can create fuel. Um, and if you've got um, frozen water on the polar ice caps, you've got hydrogen, and then all of a sudden you can start making some very interesting hydrocarbon-based fuel. So therefore, the point is, you don't have to lug all the oxygen and fuel to Mars to get back. You can make it there. Uh, just send the equipment, uh, make your own fuel, make your own oxygen, and then um, you're done. So uh, yeah, so I thought that was very interesting. There's much, much more to come from uh, the Perseverance rover. And with that, we are done. Slightly eclectic this week, but hopefully that was interesting.